the holes on shear connections. Okay. AISC specification prior to 2005, when bearing bolts are used, welds cannot share the load. The field weld must design to the total load. When slip critical bolts are used, the bolts and welds may share the load. The field weld may be designed to transfer only the portions of the load not transferred by bolts. Pretension the bolts before making the welds. Okay, this is what we had, and we, we've never, never really had a problem with this. Um, although some of you may have read this article by Shane Carnier recently that said, just because we haven't had a problem doesn't mean that what we were doing was right. You know, uh, we, what we've got in the, in the uh, 2005 specification, we say bolts shall not be considered sharing load with welds except that in shear connections, any grade of bolt, permitted in the section here, installed in standard holes or short slots transverse are permitted to share the load with longitudinally loaded fillet wells. Uh, the available strength of bolts in such connections shall not be taken as greater than 50% of the available strength of bearing type bolts in the connection. I, I jokingly say that we're going to have to tighten up the immigration laws with Canada because this is some research out of the University of Alberta in a sort of has turned us upside down, this and some welding requirements. But the rationale is, and their studies have shown, is, is that if you're trying to share loads between wells and bolts, and you're trying to do it with slip critical, is that by the time you can get enough deformation for your wells to pick up loads, your bolts will have slipped. And so they're saying that that's the problem with trying to do what we've been doing in the past. On the other hand, they're saying that Longitudinally uh, fillet welds have a great deal of deformation capabilities. And so you can have a bearing type connection and you can, you can bear, you can get a certain amount of bolts bearing and the longitudinal well, low, wells will deform enough so you can combine them provided you're in standard holes. Uh, if you're in oversized holes, you're basically going to end up having to weld it to develop the full strength of the connection. Uh, so this is, this is a, a fairly significant change in the 2005 spec, and that's the rationale on it. So it'll change some of the details you've got here. Uh, this is a simple beam. In this particular case, we simply welded it up. No problem there. Uh, this is a simple beam to column with uh, missing one row of bolts. And uh, this, is, this is strange in the fact that uh, we're showing here that if you had three-quarter inch A325N bolts, you had to weld to develop the connection. We, before, if we had slip critical, we said you could weld just down here because all you had to do is weld for the two bolts that were missing. Well, I don't know anybody that would send an iron worker up there with a welding uh, machine and tell them to only weld two inches down here. You'd weld it like this, you know, as long as you're going to do it. But nowadays, of course, what you could say here is, is that <coughs> you, could, you could say that uh, these two bolts uh, well, if you're missing the two bolts, all you'd have to do is weld for whatever the two bolts were. Well, take that back. You'd have to reduce these bolts 50% and then design these for the weld for the difference. Take the available bolts, take 50% of the capacity, and then design the weld for the difference. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another case, again, we're talking about, uh, you know, the, you have in here, uh, where you had N-type bolts and you had to weld to develop the connection, slip critical bolts. You're, this is basically what you're going to do now. Uh, is you're going to you're going to weld and you might be able to use a little smaller fillet weld, you know, because you can get partial strength on those bolts, 50% of the strength. Uh, now this is a case. This is a gusset plate uh, on a brace, big bracing connection. And you can see in here that the holes are off because you can uh, see the edge of the flange through the hole. So this whole line of bolts is missing. And uh, this is the detail then. Now, this was done, I'm sure, under the previous specification. Now, normally, if you'd had a condition like this, what you'd have probably done is replaced the gusset plate, you know, so you, it would match the holes. But in this particular job, I believe, this gusset plate was not manufactured in the United, or not fabricated in the United States. The job was not fabricated in the United States. So replacement of the gusset plate was going to be sort of difficult. And uh, so what they've done is they've filled the holes here and then have probably welded on the back side. 
Now, if you're looking at the 2005 specification, again, you could take 50% of these bolts and you'd have to put enough weld on there to develop the difference between it. Uh, there were a lot of problems here, apparently. It looks like they might have had to redrill another hole in here. I'm not sure what some of these holes out here are doing. Normally, normally I would not recommend plugging holes. Uh, in this case, these were plugged probably more for architectural purposes. You know, it, it makes people uncomfortable if you're in a big arena and look up and see a whole bunch of holes open. <laughs> so I think that's the reason those were plugged there. Uh, and uh, here we talk about some other conditions. Uh, this happens to be a, a bracing condition where you have a gusset plate and the uh, connection angle on the gusset plate doesn't line up. And you, the, here they say fabricate new angles and match existing conditions. Uh, that's sort of difficult to do, you know, depending on how that angle is welded on there in order to cut that angle off and then put a new angle on. Uh, there are several other solutions we'll talk about. By the way, if we were detailing this connection, what our shop and our structural connection designers would prefer would be to not use angles but to use an end plate or use continuous angles and cope this out so that we control that dimension in here. Because this problem, if there's a problem in here, it's probably because this angle was not welded on in the right place, more than likely. So by making this one continuous member and making it an end plate is, is the easiest way to do it. Uh, the problem that you have with this is, is that if these things are being detailed by, for instance, uh, SDS2, this is the connection SDS2 defaults to in a brace connection. And you have to go back and tell your detailer, I want you to manually change this. And they always mumble and grumble and stuff like that. And we say, yeah, but it's going to save us more in the shop, but it's going to cost us in the, in the engineering department. But that's part of the problems we have with special details or with programs, CAN programs that do this. Uh, here's another case. Now, those of you that are, should be familiar with the uniform force method of bracing connections, this shows you that in this brace connection, you, you have a horizontal component up here. And what that means is, is that you simply can't come in and weld the outstanding legs of that angle because you can't develop that horizontal force in bending in the legs of the angles. So a couple of solutions they're talking about is stripping this off and using a pair of shear bars up here or maybe stripping the angles back and uh, welding in here so that your outstanding leg of your angle is short enough that you, you, the bending is not an issue. Again, you're talking about a lot of work trying to cut these things off the angle. I would suggest that there is another solution on this thing, and that is, is that the great thing about uniform force method is you can provide alternate load paths. And so if you went back and analyzed this so that you analyzed and you had a moment on this surface right here, you can eliminate that horizontal force off those angles. Then you can simply weld the angles for the vertical shear, and you, all you have to do is increase the capacity of that uh, weld here. In a lot of cases, that weld has already got enough capacity in it, but it's going to be a lot easier to come in and put another couple of passes on that gusset plate than it is to try to mess around with that. So there's another solution to this that we don't really show here. Uh, bolts don't fit in the holes. You can ream the holes. Uh, you can uh, field weld, field, fill and drill, and then you can replace the connection material. Uh, again, if it's a bolted, bolted connection, you probably the easiest thing is to replace the bolted connection, uh, make a new connection. Uh, if it's just a few holes in a connection, you can ream it. Uh, field welding is also another solution if you got a, if it's excess and it doesn't create other problems. Filling and drilling is probably the least desirable. Uh, filling holes is a difficult thing to do and do well. Uh, if it's relatively light angles, it's maybe not that much of a problem. Uh, AWS really doesn't have a procedure for restoring holes other than in situations where it's a fatigue situation. And when you, when you have a condition like that, their procedure is, is that the hole has to, first of all, be elongated into a boat-shaped hole so that you can lay uh, stringer passes into the hole. And then you have to fill the whole thing up. And then you have to come back and back out to the backside. There's just a whole series of things you would do. Generally, just filling the hole works. Uh, 
but you know, for most statically loaded conditions. But uh, the idea is, is that you'd like to have proper detailing. And uh, maybe if it's bracing connections designed using slip critical bolts and oversized holes to allow some fit up clearances and stuff. Uh, use of short slots. You know, I, I, I didn't talk about this when we were talking about uh, camber and I talked about how the end connections change and the slope of the end connections. Uh, those, that slope on the end connection can be, oh, uh, in some cases you can get three eighths of an inch difference, you know. And so what you really would like to do is frame that to either a single plate or single angle that has short slots on the support. And those slot, short slots will accommodate that variation in the end slope. That's one of the reasons why we like to use one-sided connections. And we'll talk more about that later in the design section. Uh, how much is too much reaming? Maximum size depends on the original hole size. Uh, usually you go an eighth inch larger and use the next larger size bolts. Uh, uh, if you're in slip critical, you might be able to get by with something else. Uh, you want to check if the edge distances are permissible after reaming. You know, there, and I, I haven't been able to locate it, haven't had a chance to do this. I should do this. Somewhere there was a study about um, where you have, say, a pattern of, I don't know, eight holes that if you've got two or three holes that are just slightly off, instead of reaming them out to an eighth inch larger, to run a reamer through for the same size holes you need would be adequate. Uh, and we have a general rule in our shop that, you know, if we have uh, connections that are, you know, typically eight bolts or something like that, that if we have a couple of holes that we have to ream, we will just run the same size hole through there and clean it out, uh, provided we don't take out more than about a, a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch on, the, on those two holes. Uh, there's a lot more capacity in these bolt holes than that. So we, we we look at that. We just clean the holes up with minimum reaming. reaming. Uh, bolt holes have insufficient edge distances. Uh, solution is to perform an analysis to see if uh, the insufficient edge distance is determined detrimental to the safety and add material to increase the edge distance. That's tough to do, you know. Uh, I mean, if you've got an end distance on your beam and you, you need an additional quarter inch of material, uh, what are you going to do? I mean, you can't just add a quarter of an inch to the end of the beam very well. You'd almost have to weld on a longer plate and then cut it off. Uh, so the better thing is to always try to detail your holes so you've got extra edge distance on here that uh, if you have a problem, uh, you know, you're, you're still going to have enough end distance in that. One of the things you should probably keep in mind is, is that uh, the uh, specification, the 2005 has it, and I think the previous LRFD specification has uh, some uh, limitations on bearing end bearing uh, when you have loads uh, normal to the end of the member that significantly reduce the capacity of the joint. So you should look at that. If you look in the 2005 specification, we have a table that gives you sort of it's like a recommended end and edge distances and stuff like that. But we do say that it is permissible to come back and run calculations to determine that if in your particular joint, a lesser end distance still works. Uh, columns are bents uh, tied together with precast concrete or timber. Uh, I'm going to have to move. I'm going to make the break. Otherwise, I'll run into afternoon. Uh, this is a case where, and I don't know if you use it down here. We used to use it where you would have a, a line of columns and beams, and then tying them together would be precast plank, or in some case tees, but generally plank. The idea being is you've got a minimum uh, clearance situation in the, in the building, uh, and uh, it, it's an economical way to build it. I don't know that OSHA would permit that right now unless you use special procedures to hold those steel lines in place. When we first started doing this, we would stand these things up with reasonable size anchor rods and stuff, and the erector would plumb these, the steel, and then the precast guy would come in and put plank in, and of course he'd slam it around and hit the columns, and they'd all walk out of plumb, and then we'd argue about who was responsible for plumb. What we've done now is we provide tie beams. It's, it's cheaper and less expensive, and generally they can stay in there, and you don't have to provide one at every floor if you provide one per tier. So you got some positive thing holding the columns in alignment, you know, it's holding the spacing on the columns. It can be a relatively shallow beam because it's just a strut in there. 
it's erection aid. If you have to, you can come back and take them out. Uh, wrong size or bolts. Avoid using different grades of bolts in the same diameter. Design your structure using only one or two sizes of bolts. Uh, we, uh, well, I guess we, I don't know. We, <coughs> you know, typically we don't like to use an A325 and an A490 in the same diameter. Uh, you know, CSD is a little more conservative than we are. They say that if you're using a three-quarter inch A325, you should use a one-inch A490. You know, we say if you've got a seven-eighths inch, you should be able to tell the difference, you know. The other thing you can keep in mind is, is that if you've got one or two connections in this job that need the, you know, uh, if they're all seven-eighths inch A325 and they've got a couple of connections where you'd like to use some 490s, it's all right to use them. Just you have to set up some sort of a quality program to make sure those connections are identified and you verify you get the right bolts in them. Uh, erection aids, I don't know if this is, would be considered an approved erection aid under OSHA right now because they say you have to have one bolt in the end of a bracing member. It's only illustrated. We've, we've done hundreds of members like this and never had a problem. Nice thing about it is you don't have to drill the HSS uh, and it's easy for detailing and some fit up adjustment. But the key thing when you're talking about erection aids, and erection aids generally happen where you have field welding and quite often where you have HSS and HSS architecturally exposed are a special problem because probably any erection aid is going to have to be cut off and ground and finished and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, the erector is really responsible for determining what erection aids are, are needed, but the fabricator is the one that has to detail and furnish them, so they have to really coordinate. Uh, and if, if the fabrication and erection is not in the same package, it gets to be a problem. So perhaps, you know, you, you either need to show a little something on your drawings and say that the fabricator and erector shall provide and coordinate during design. Uh, and if they have to be removed, make a note of it. Uh, welding considerations. Okay. Uh, here's our formula. You know, carbon equivalent. I found out something just two weeks ago. Uh, I was looking at the carbon equivalent on an uh, ASTM 992. The, the A6 requirement or 992 specification requires that the carbon equivalent now be shown on the MILSERT. You know, not just the, the chemistry, but you have to actually show the carbon equivalent. And I was running some, uh, some preheat requirements under uh, AWS and I was coming up with different numbers and there's a slightly different carbon equivalent formula in ASTM from AWS. Uh, I can't remember where it is. One of these numbers, whether it's the silicon or one of the other numbers, is not in the ASTM uh, thing. And Tom Schlafly from AISC had to inform me of the difference and why the difference was there. But anyway, uh, the uh, <clears throat> how do you know if the steel is weldable and able? If your carbon is less than 0.5, you can use the standard AWS D1.1 preheat tables. If you get over 45, uh, you're going to have to use special preheats, and, and you really should go to AWS uh, D1.1, the annex, uh, to check out for these high carbon steels. Most 992 steels, if you're going to look at them, the carbon equivalents are going to come in the low 30s, typically. Uh, some of them might even be less than that, you know. So they're, they're very weldable. Where you find the higher carbons is in the plate. Particularly, you know, plate's a commodity item. Uh, unless you're buying plate for bridges or especially for plate girders, you're probably buying plate from service center out of stock plate sizes, 72 inches wide by 20, 40 foot long. And this could be made anywhere in the world, you know. And so some of it's coming out of the old ingot-based processes, maybe from Eastern Europe or some other place. And it'll meet the, AS, the uh, ASTM requirements for 36 or 572, but uh, it probably is, is may have carbon up in the, 20, in the 40s range or something like that. I know whenever I do preheats on uh, cover plates and stuff like that, but I usually find that the plate's going to govern the preheat requirements. Uh, uh, how do we know if steel's weldable? You've got mill certification. Jim talked about cutting or drilling samples for laboratory analysis. Uh, wet chemistry on a piece of steel is not that expensive. Uh, you know, 
I think the last time I had it done was uh, under $300. You know, inflation might be a little bit more, but that's really not a big issue. Uh, there's the old uh, ironworker method, and that is is that you take a, an angle or a plate and put a fillet weld on one side, and then you break it off ac across the root. If it breaks in the weld, you know, you've got good fusion and you're okay, but if it breaks off the surface, you know, you've got some problems with the carbon. Uh, you should also probably pay attention if in the shop your tack wells or something are breaking, then maybe you better dig out your, your uh, carbon requirement or your mill certs on that plate or something like that to see if you've got relatively high carbon. Uh, you know, vis visual inspection is really what we say should be done for uh, uh, steel inspection. This is the primary way of inspecting steel. You want to, first of all, prohibit it all cracks. You want to make sure you got weld metal and base metal fusion. We'd like to have some penetration, but fusion is all that's required, that the weld, weld is well adhered to the base metal. Crater cross sections, except that intermittent fillet wells are filled. Weld profiles are as shown. In other words, you want the weld on a fillet weld, for instance, to have a slight crown to the fillet weld. You don't want it concave. You don't want it to look like it was squeezed out of a toothpaste tube. You know, there's, there's certain profiles you should have. For a butt weld, there's a certain amount of reinforcement that you could have on the joint. Those are requirements that you should meet. Uh, weld size, there's requirements for weld size. Uh, you can, you're allowed to be certain undersized on certain fillets on webbed flange and some other cases. Uh, undercut, uh, you know, there's requirements on how much undercut you can have. And uh, there's requirements on porosity. And those are all basic requirements that you have. Uh, and now to prevent welding problems, there's really four areas that you want to be concerned about. One is welder certification. Make sure your welders can do a weld. You want a weld procedure specification. In other words, they should have a good procedure for making weld. Then you want the inspection by the fabricator and direction. And then finally, there's the verification inspection. And that's what you, as a structural engineer, work out with your owner what you're going to do. The first three of those are really the responsibility of the fabricator or rector. They're the ones that have to take care of these issues. And if you're going to have an AISC certified fabricator or an AISC certified rector, you're, he's going to have to have all that stuff in place and programs to do all this stuff. Uh, okay, so welder certifications. Certifications <coughs> are, are involved the process. You know, is it sub-arc? Is it stick? Uh, shielded metal arc, we'd call it. Uh, the joint type, is it a fillet weld or is it complete joint penetration? Material thickness, you know, is it less than an inch or over an inch so it's unlimited thickness? The position, is he positioning in the full flat or is he doing it overhead? Uh, special conditions, well, special conditions involve, for instance, making uh, CJP wells in uh, HSS, unbacked HSS wells, you know, where you got unbacked weld joints. That requires special certification. It requires a 6GR certification. That's why we say that when you're doing HSS joints, uh, a TY and K joint, to try it at all possible, and there should be no reason unless you've got some special fatigue conditions, what your, condi your joint wells should all be fillet wells or partial joint penetration wells. Otherwise, you've got to go to 6GR, which requires not only special testing of your welders, uh, it's more expensive well to make. It's special inspection problems, just a lot of issues. So you want to try to avoid those. Some pipe wells require special conditions, special certification. Duration, AWS says that as long as you're con you have evidence you continue to weld in the process, your uh, certification continues indefinitely. If you're in a fab shop like ours, our QC people will every three months, six months, depending on if it's three months of its highway, it's six months for building, they will go through and list all the welders, list all their stuff, and they will make sure that they have welded in the last six months in that thing. And they will keep a record like that showing their current. Uh, new seismic requirements are going to put some additional things. There are some special quality requirements in the seismic things where they require additional testing and some special testing. Uh, <coughs> seismic's going to, if you're going to do seismic stuff from now on, you're going to be responsible for verifying this, uh, the next issue which we've got here, which is the uh, WPS. And if you don't feel qualified to it, you probably better go out and get a firm that can review the WPSs and make sure they're right. 
but typically you're going to have a process that's going to be maybe a flux cord arc process. The joint type is probably going to be done a complete, uh, they would normally do a CJP one inch plate which be allow them to do all the thicknesses in that. Material, again like say one inch, if it'd be unlimited. Position is going to depend on where you're going to work. If we're working in the shop, we can probably live with a horizontal position because we're going to position most everything. If you're doing an erector in the field, he probably want that guy certified for overhead because he may he not he will not be able to position everything. So that's what they would want to do. And uh, the erectors have a little bit of problems. They may have to recertify people because they they haven't been with the company and they don't have a certificate showing they're currently certified. Well procedure specification. This is really <coughs> WPS. AWS has always, for a long period of time, I don't know how far back, has required that every structural weld have a written WPS. People have generally not paid a lot of attention to this. Since Northridge, everybody became very concerned because they found that there were a lot of welds being made on critical seismic demand joints that did not meet a, a WPS requirements. I mean, they were putting weld passes in there that were two or three times the maximum prohibited. There are a lot of problems like that. But anyway, typically, if you're going to do a WPS on a joint, it's not, almost every case is going to be pre-qualified. That means it's a joint that's already approved by AWS. It's one of those that you see in the figures in AWS for the grooves or for the fillet wells. Material is going to be one that's approved by AWS, so it's going to be pre-qualified. Uh, the process, again, is an AWS process. It's going to be pre-qualified. It's going to be either a stick, flux core, uh, you know, sub-arc, some of these processes that are all approved. The filler metals <coughs> will be, again, an AWS pre-qualified filler metal. And then finally, you've got operating parameters, which are going to be your, your volts and amps, your travel speed that you're going to have. And these are all going to be based on the manufacturer's uh, qualifications. So you'll have to have the manufacturer's qualification showing that you're working within the operating parameters. You put all that together, and that's a recipe for making the joint. Again, it sounds like a lot, but what happens is, is as a fabricator, we have, you know, you can probably do maybe a dozen WPSs, and we'll cover most of the structural wells you got. Then, as a special one comes up, you add it to the book, and then finally we get a nice big thick book. And so, when the engineer asks for our WPSs, we can send him that whole big book, you know. And just like when we ask for loads on a joint, you send us the computer printout, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, we're getting close here, and I think we can make it. Uh, fabrication and erection, this is what the fabricator and erector is required to do. We're required to verify the size and length, verify that there's a WPS and it's being used, verify the electrodes have been cared for, in other ways they've been kept dry and meet all the requirements, that the joint prep and assembly is right, you know, they've got the right root openings and all this sort of stuff. And then finally, met all those visual requirements that we talked about before. Now the owner, <clears throat> this is where you come in and you determine about what do you want to do. Do you want to audit our stuff? Do you want to do 100% visual? Uh, do you want to do some NDT? Uh, if you're going to do NDT, you have to specify it in the contract documents. You know, so if you're going to do some mag particle, you're going to do some UT. It's supposed to be specified in the contract documents. Theoretically, if you if you don't specify it in the contract documents and come back in and require it. You're responsible for all costs associated with it. And that even theoretically would include rework associated with it unless you could prove that the fabricator was grossly negligent. But we don't want to get into those problems. We just want to have a level playing field. Tell us ahead of time so we can cooperate and make arrangements for the inspection. So they can be done. They should be inspected in the shop. Nothing is worse than having somebody ship stuff to the field and then in the field saying, oh, gee, you know, this doesn't meet what we want. Uh, talk about some repairs, well cracks, you want to determine the extent of the crack. Try to determine the reason for the crack because when you repair it, you hope it doesn't crack again. You want to remove it completely, you know, so it doesn't generate again. You should have a repair procedure for it, and then you want to inspect it to make sure that, that the repair is there. Extent of the crack, you can generally do it visually. You might want to use some dye penetrant or some mag particle, you know. If it's a real heavy piece, thick piece, you might want to use some UT to try to determine the depth of the crack, you know, see if you can verify it. Try to map it out. And uh, reasons could be because you got joint restraint. You know, you got a couple of heavy pieces together and it's finished, 
so that there's there's nowhere for the thing the a lot of restraint. Uh, it might be because you didn't have enough preheat on the on the joint. Maybe because you've got too much carbon in some of these things. Uh, your weld procedure might not be right. Uh, you may not have the right joint for it. You could have some moisture contamination. Maybe your material doesn't meet spec. You know, we've had that happen before, where we've had uh, some pieces that we were starting to fabricate. They started to crack, and we tried to find our mill search, and we hadn't had the mill search yet. So we started calling to the mill, and, and uh, we finally did some tests on it and found out that they had had some. This was not again a U.S. mill. It's a mill no longer in service out of Canada, but uh, the material was actually intended for abrasion-resistant plate, so it was extremely hard. It had a Brunel over 400 instead of like 200 or something like that, and. Uh, so there can be things like that happen. If it's out in the field, it might be that there's some sort of unanticipated load or service condition. Uh, we had a joint, we did a job with CSD down in Casa Grande, Arizona. Strange building. It was uh, 200 and some foot high and about uh, 70 foot wide. And it was an industrial facility. Had five foot deep plate girders spanning across it, you know, and big moment frames all the way up the thing. And we did all these things. We had some problems with our welders, with our erector making some of the moment connections on these big girders to the 36-inch columns. In the end bay, we, we, of course, we had intermediate columns, so we had like 14-inch columns, and we had 16 and 18-inch beams on the end wall and stuff like that. And we had <coughs> one moment connection there. I don't know, it was on a 1430 or something like that. Welded it up and it cracked. We said, oh, I must have screwed up the welding. Cleaned it out, re-welded it, it cracked. I think we did it three times, and every time it cracked. And we finally modified the joint. The only thing we could figure out is you're down here in the Arizona desert, and you're on an end wall, and there are so much thermal stresses that you can't track through this structure that that was what was causing the problem. We were getting some sort of a column differential movement or something that was overloading the joint. It should have still deformed, but for some reason or other, we were cracking. So we ended up changing the joint. Jim talked about. <coughs> uh, banging bolts. Uh, we were giving this talk in New Orleans, and we talked about banging bolts. And afterwards, a guy came up and said he had a job with banging bolts, and he figured it was just that. He went out and inspected the structure, and he found he was getting settlement in the structure. And there was significant column settlement, which was what was forcing the bolts into bearing. So when you hear something like that, you know, you got to look at it and try to use your mind to, you know, figure out what might be there. Anyway, uh, remove the crack completely. You've got sound metal shall be removed beyond the end of the crack. Uh, you should prep it for a uh, repair weld. You'd like to sort of boat shape that crack, you know, so that you, can, you don't trap stuff at the end of it. And then you want to verify it that the crack has been removed. Uh, anyway, we've talked about it. Excavation shall be cleaned and shaped to remove the weld. And, you, you know, have a repair procedure. Write a little procedure for uh, covering the preheat that you might want to do and weld pass requirements. You might have to have special preheat if it's a lot of restraint in that joint, you know. And uh, you, you have to, we've had cases where we've tried to put uh, heavy continuity plates into like a 14-inch oh, 605 or 730. And uh, we've had a hard time getting those welds in there because there's so much restraint with those big flanges that uh, as the welds would cool, they tend to crack before they can pick up enough strength. Uh, you want to clean and grind the surface, visually inspect, and you'd like to wait on heavy stuff, you know, 24 to 48 in hours to see if the thing might crack again, you know. And uh, a couple of last things here, AWS D1.1 section 6.8, engineer's approval for alternate acceptance criteria. You can, you, <coughs> AWS is really a performance-based workmanship type code, and they allow the engineer of record to take exceptions to the provisions of AWS D1.1. Most structural engineers would say, hey, I'm not an expert in welding or metallurgy or fracture mechanics, and so how can I take exception? Well, the thing about it is, is that what you do know is you do know the structure, and you do know the loads in that structure, and that's important. And, and based on that, you can make some decisions. Here are the reasons why you could make some variations, suitability for service, experience, experimental evidence, engineering analysis, and the load. For instance, if, if you've got a, a web-defined weld and you've got some undercut on it, 
or maybe some undersized. Let's say undersized. And let's say you had called out a 5 16th weld, and you're allowed 10% of that can be a quarter inch under AWS. And let's say you've got 50% that's quarter inch weld. And, but maybe you look at your shear in that thing and say, hey, quarter inch weld's going to work. You know? So do I want him to go back and lay another pass or two on that thing and build it out? No, it's one of these cases where a fix isn't required. On the other hand, if you've got 20 girders to do and he's got one like this, you'd tell him, hey, I want the other 19 to look right, you know, but I'm not going to make you repair this one or something. So, uh, and I'm, I'm a great believer sometimes in uh, doing a little uh, mock-up or a detail. Uh, one example was is that we were doing uh, Minneapolis Convention Center, and it had a... Uh, HSS space frame surrounding three lamella domes. And uh, AWS says that when you have a butt joint, you know, CJP butt joint, that if you have a difference in thickness, you have to transition those thicknesses. In other words, you have to bevel one side down or slope it with a weld. Well, that's fine if you're doing a plate or a flange of a plate girder. What happens when you're doing an HSS? If you're doing, say, a 6x6 six six, uh, HSS and you're doing, say, a quarter inch to a half inch wall, the variations on the inside. How are you going to taper the inside of that of that six of that half inch wall? Well, AWS is, I think is changing that. In fact, I think the new code will avoid that for statically loaded structures. But what we ended up doing in this case is we did a mock up. We did a, uh, a backer bar inside the quarter inch. We did a CJP weld on the quarter inch to a half inch wall. We cut some strips out. We pulled them, and uh, we easily developed the required strength. And based on that, and we had John Fisher at Lehigh do a little review of it, based on that, the engineer of records said, fine, don't worry about the transition. So you can do little mock-ups like that and, and give you some, some confidence and some backup for your variations. And that's break time. We're not doing too bad. A couple of minutes long, I guess, aren't we? Where's Steve? There you are. <laughs>